Welcome and good evening. My name is Carly Taxtall and I am pleased to welcome you to the Community Science and Technology Virtual Seminar Series, sponsored by Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. This seminar series is intended to introduce you to the world-class research that has been taking place right here in your community. More information and registration for upcoming webinars can be found on our PNL events page. You can also find recordings of past seminar series using the link in the chat window. Oops, that really quick. Um, I'd like to pause for a moment and do a quick couple of polls. If you turn your attention to your screen, you should see the polling feature pop up. Um, because we've gone virtual with, these ser with this series, we'd like to check in with you and find out where you were listening from and a little bit about the demographic of our attendees. So we have where are you joining from and what best describes the stage of your career? Awesome, I think we have a lot of people in Tri-Cities and surrounding regions. Um, if you're joining internationally or elsewhere in the Pacific Northwest, we go ahead and post in the chat. We love to see where everybody's joining from. We have some people from SQUIM, where Laneg is from, one of our presenters in Seattle. We have um, quite a bit of retired people on tonight, some working and a few students, it's awesome. Well, thank you for your feedback. Um, at the end of tonight's talk, it would be greatly appreciated if you could take our brief survey. I'll post that little link in the chat as well. Um, the survey link should be in the chat. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to give us your feedback. It is also an opportunity to sign up for emails about future seminars and other community events. Before you learn more about tonight's topic, your presenters will give a brief overview of the National Labs system and PNL's missions. You will also learn more about Battelle, the operator of PNL, and its staff and how they take pride in being excellent community stewards through phil philanthropy and volunteering. Now, let me introduce tonight's presentation and speaker so we can get started. Tonight's presentation is Got Them All, measuring the variation of fish species in a tidal channel in space and time using only water samples. Your presenters tonight are Owen Weiser and Laneg Hemry. Dr. Lene Hemry is a marine ecologist trained as a naturalist with multi multidisciplinary background in molecular ecology and community ecology. Combining fieldwork, laboratory experiments, and numerical modeling, her research focuses on characterizing the environmental effects of marine energy, offshore wind, and marine carbon dioxide removal. Dr. Owen Leiser is a microbiologist with a background in genomic and protomic analysis of wide variety of bacteria and, and viruses in the mammalian host in the environment. Um, his research interests center on biological mechanisms driving of evolutionary adaption to new hosts and new environments, as well as the effects of environmental perturbation on micro microbial community composition and functional interactions. They will be telling you a little bit more about themselves. So with that, the floor is yours. Welcome. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm gonna start, um, as, as Carly mentioned, my name is Owen Leiser. I'm a researcher at PNNL and I'm based in our Seattle office. Um, some folks don't realize we don't just exist in the Tri-Cities, we have uh, about, Oh, two or 300 people in Seattle and a number of folks out in SQUIM as well, um, where Laneg is based. Um, and I'm a microbiologist by training, by education, and um, I got to use some of the techniques that I've learned and uh, figured out how to use over the, over the years um, to ask similar questions about fish. And so this is a pretty, pretty interesting project to be a part of, and I'm glad that, that uh, Laneg asked me to come aboard. Um, so I'm going to start out tonight um, by telling you a little bit about uh, PNNL and what we're all about. Um, so we're part of the Department of Energy or DOE. Um, uh, we have the DOE has 17 national laboratories across the United States. Um, uh, we kind of we were joking earlier whether we should have an Oppenheimer or a Barbie reference. Um, I think we're going to go with Oppenheimer because uh, folks that have seen that movie know about us. Um, we were 
Uh, the National Lab Complex and Pena in, in, in particular, um, we grew out of the Manhattan Project um, way back in the 40s. Um, uh, in addition, we had Los Alamos National Laboratories down in New Mexico, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, um, or the places that grew into these laboratories in Tennessee, um, were created to meet this initial mission for the DOE. Um, today, as I mentioned, we have 17 national laboratories across the country. Um, we sort of run the gamut of scientific investigation. Uh, we do energy, environmental questions. We work in national security. Um, and each of each of the national labs has its own sort of specialty um, and its own unique tools, uh, capabilities, facilities to address uh, problems that face the nation and that the Department of Energy has been tasked to uh, to tackle. And I think, Lene, you have control, so I'll just ask you to do the next slide. Maybe, yeah, there it goes. Uh, so this is a uh, this is a, a picture of an overhead picture of our Richland campus. Um, folks that live out there have probably seen this uh, before as you drive by on the highway. Um, we like to say that we're a, a national lab with Pacific Northwest roots um, and and with a global reach. Um, so. We work on all kinds of things that uh, affect not only the nation, but also uh, our worldwide partners. It could be the U.S. power grid, um, safeguarding ports around the world um, that might be involved in smuggling of illicit materials. Um, and the, the, the main goal that we have is to address challenges um, that challenge us to create a safer, uh, a cleaner, and a more prosperous uh, a nation and, and the world. Uh, we were founded in 1965, and we are currently operated by Battelle um, for the DOE, um, and, and specifically the DOE Office of Science. Um, and the DOE Office of Science is actually the single largest supporter of basic research in the physical sciences in the U.S. So we're pretty proud to be, to be a part of that legacy and a part of that ongoing research effort. So next slide, please. So we like to think that um, we advance scientific discovery um, and drive innovation um, uh, by focusing on three areas. Um, so first is scientific discovery. Um, so we have some pretty significant signature capabilities in chemistry, in earth sciences, in biology and data science. Um, we advance our discovery and we create solutions as we go uh, to, to address the, the challenges that face us as a nation. I think it's a multi, multi-click side. Thank you, Lene. Um, the the uh, other uh, sort of things that surround this are sustainable energy and national security. So we have an expertise in energy production and energy storage, delivery, decarbonization, um, and this really drives the development of technologies and discoveries that uh, improve our our um, energy security in our nation. And then also uh, we. Other side of the house focuses on national security, and so we really advance science-based solutions um, that that are targeted by long-term U.S. missions for nuclear security, for radiological security. We work in critical infrastructure product, uh, protection, and then as well as like chemical and biological threat reduction. So those are three kind of we call it the orb. <laughs> it is the PNL orb. Uh, so next slide, please. And then uh, we distinguish ourselves um, by our strengths that enable our impact. Um, so in the center, we have our four like core capabilities, chemistry, earth sciences, data sciences, and biology. Um, and they sort of underpin our discovery and our, our discovery work and our applied work. Um, so we work to advance um, sustainable energy um, through decarbonization, through energy storage, through novel energy production mechanisms. And then we also um, have a national security expertise um, that is related to uh, nuclear materials, nuclear threat analysis, those sort of things. So that's sort of how we define ourselves. And next slide, please. And we are very proud that we are one of the DOE's most diversified national laboratories. So uh, this pie chart here on the right is showing uh, the proportion of spending that we, that we have here. Um, in fiscal year, this is 2022, uh, we spent about $1.34 billion of taxpayer money. And this, so this all comes from government 
grants that we as researchers write. Um, we put them into competitive pools and are awarded. Um, so on the, the right side of that pie chart, you've got um, that's DOE based funding. So Office of Science, we have Energy Environment, we have National Security. Uh, we also do somewhere around a third of our um, of our work is funded by non DOE sponsors. So this could be the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, uh, just depending on who who uh, has money that they want to spend on us answering the questions and addressing the challenges that they have. Uh, we have about 5,700 staff across our three campuses, um, and we've estimated. Well, I say we. Somebody who crunches numbers uh, higher at a higher level than I do, uh, estimates that it, there's an additional couple of thousand jobs that are related to uh, to us as an, as an economic driver. Um, we, in fiscal year 22, uh, had, I'm sorry, 21, we put out about 1,800 peer-reviewed publications. So we think of these as like scientific papers. Um, we're pretty proud of that. And uh, close to 300 invention disclosures. So we think of these as like patent applications for technologies that people at the lab have been have been um, developing. And next slide. And this this slide uh, showcases um, something that I'm really proud of personally as as an employee of p and 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 a researcher here. We're not just behind a desk all day. Um, we lots of us go out and do philanthropic things. We engage with the community. Um, Battelle has invested a little over $30 million in uh, mo mostly in the Tri-Cities community, but also in, in, in the Squim area as well, um, into charities and uh, community engagement, civic engagement uh, organizations. Um, so it's, it's really great that folks, we don't, like I said, we don't just like to sit behind our desks. We like to actually go out and give back to our communities. And part of that, honestly, is having talks like this, where we get to talk about the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so that's just a little bit of background from, from, uh, from P&L. Um, you know, we're happy to answer questions about that as well, in addition to anything you have questions about for the actual science. So I'm going to give it back to Lene, and she's going to talk about some science. Hi, yes. So thank you, Owen, for uh, starting us by presenting PNNL. So today, uh, you all came to listen to us uh, talking about uh, fish uh, in the Tidal Channel and how we uh, get those fish from water samples only. And so this work is not the work by just Owen or myself. It, uh, it's a work from a, a team that you can see all the names here. Um, so we had through the team, uh, especially two interns that worked uh, last summer on the summer before, Michel Fu and Emily Bondi, who did uh, very great work for the project. We would not have had all the results that we will present tonight without the two of them. And we uh, also work with our colleagues, uh, Nikki Sather and Tony Chien, who are both at PNNL. And so on the menu for tonight, um, so I will start with uh, an introduction to set up the context of uh, the presentation and present the myth methods uh, of our work, so how we did it. And then Owen will take over to present the results or wh what we found out uh, during our project. And then I'll take back to conclude uh, before we open for the Q&A. Um, so let's get started with uh, the introduction. So this work was, was funded by uh, the DOE Water Power Technologies Office as it relates to marine energy. So what is marine energy? Uh, it's also called marine renewable energy or MRE or marine and hydrokinetic energy or MHK. So you might have heard all three terms. Uh, I'll try to stick to marine energy throughout this presentation. So marine energy is the energy harvested from the movement of water in the oceans or large rivers, and also from ocean gradients. So it's energy harvested from waves, from tides, from ocean currents like the Gulf Stream, from uh, river flows, but without using hydraulic electrical dams, and also from temperature gradients in areas with a high difference between surface, warm surface temperature and cold deep water, and a salinity gradient where you have uh, fresh water meeting uh, seawater. And as you can see from this list, we are not listing offshore wind. It's not a marine energy per se because the source of power does not come from the water 
but from the wind. So some of our work at PNNL around marine energy is to look at the potential environmental effects of the technologies. And we look at those because they are concerned from uh, the community, the general community about uh, these technologies. Those uh, concerns stem from the fact that these technologies are less known than, for example, hydroelectrical dams or offshore wind turbines. It's also a new use of the ocean space. So marine energy technologies have been in the water for only about two decades, unlike offshore wind that's been around for uh, three or four decades. Um, we also have insufficient knowledge of the ocean for the part of the, the ocean where marine energy is harvested. Uh, often it's a uh, high energy environment, like uh, areas where the uh, current is very strong or where the waves are very big. And so there are areas that researchers tend to avoid going at sea because it's rough, it's challenging, and it's not very friendly. And so we don't know much about those uh, areas. And uh, also um, marine species in general have been under stress uh, in the recent decades, especially due to climate change, but also other activities at sea. And so we don't want marine energy to add uh, yet more stress to those animals. And so looking at the potential environmental effects of marine energy, We've categorized those in those seven categories below that are that summarizes the main effects. And so those are uh, the collision risk of marine animals with the turbines of the with the blades of the turbines, like you can see on these images with a seal or a fish hanging out next to tidal turbines that were hiding. There were no uh, no currents when those pictures were, were taken. There is also a risk from underwater noise that could be too loud for the animals uh, that uh, uh, use underwater, underwater noise uh, uh, for communication. We could have effects from the electromagnetic field from the cables, also the power produced by uh, wave or tidal energy uh, devices is usually much lower than uh, the power produced from uh, offshore wind turbines. So, the electromagnetic field uh, is expected to be much lower. We could also expect changes in marine habitats uh, from these turbines uh, or, or devices. And so like uh, animals uh, coming to the turbines to use them as a new habitat or uh, the devices being deployed on a seafloor habitat that is now not available anymore. We could also have a risk of entanglement from the mooring lines for the devices that are floating and so that need to be moored to the seafloor. Um, when we will have arrays of devices, so that's group farm of devices that are like 20, 30 devices, we could see some changes in the oceanographic conditions, which are uh, changes in the wave patterns or in the uh, transport of sediments in the water color and this kind of changes. And then we could also see at this scale uh, some displacement of the marine animals. That means uh, animals that may not be able to use the migration routes that they used to be. They may have to uh, go around the devices. So those are all environmental effects that we are still uh, studying to understand better what is likely or unlikely to happen on how we can mitigate them on them and work around those effects so that uh, marine energy doesn't impact uh, the environment. And so a common issue with those environmental effects is that we need to know what animals use the habitat in which uh, marine energy devices are deployed on when they use that habitat so that we can better understand the different effects. And so to do that, biodiversity surveys are usually required at marine energy sites before and after the installation of devices so that we can uh, compare the results and uh, see if we observe any change. And so some of the conventional ways of doing those biodiversity surveys include uh, using scuba divers or remotely operated vehicles, ROV, to collect underwater photos and videos. 
We could use also uh, pelagic or bottom trolls to collect fish on invertebrates. We can also use a uh, beach sand uh, nets from the shore to collect uh, shallow water fish. So those are just three examples of the uh, common methods that, that are used for those biodiversity surveys. However, those uh, methods are quite challenging to, to use in a high energy environment. So when uh, you work in a tidal channel, the tidal currents are pretty strong on the slack window. The time between the incoming tide and the outgoing tide can be very short. And so it can be challenging to deploy the, the methods and the, the window to do that can be very short. In area with uh, wave energy, then if uh, if the waves are strong, then we cannot go out to deploy our instruments. So it is challenging to do those biodiversity surveys, but there must be a way to do that. And so that's uh, where we come in with our project. And um, that's why I introduce you to environmental DNA or eDNA for short. It's uh, So it's an approach that uses any DNA or genetic material that is found in the environment that is shared by the organism. So think about the excrement of the fish on marine mammal, the skin cells, the mucus, the gametes that are released in the water for reproduction, the hairs from the seals, uh, scales from the fish, carcasses from the dead animals. All this uh, genetic material degrades in the water and on, uh, on we can collect it with uh, with environmental samples. In our case, it's uh, water, but other eDNA studies also collect air sample or soil sample. And uh, so that allows to collect the genetic material from the animals that live in the environment without collecting the animals themselves. And there are different molecular methods that are used to uh, then sort through the genetic material depending on, on what we're in interested in. And so if we are interested in doing a catalog of all the species that live in the environment, we call a we use a method that is called metabarcoding. If we are uh, interested in only one single species, we use a method that is called uh, quantitative PCR or qPCR that will allow us to uh, count, get uh, an idea of the abundance of that species. So in the project that uh, Owen and I will describe in the next uh, many slides, uh, we are focusing on the meta barcoding because we wanted to have a, a better picture of the whole uh, ecosystem. And so we use that uh, eDNA approach uh, in Squim Bay, actually in the entrance of Squim Bay, which is a tidal channel to assess how um, suitable the method would be for uh, monitoring marine energy environmental effects. And so if you are not familiar with Squim, so it's in uh, the northwest corner of Washington state where I uh, put a little square box here. And uh, it's at the entrance of a bay and the bay is actually so closed by a spit and we, the tide flows through that spit. And so you can see on uh, the video that I will start here if it works. Yes, so the red is particles, uh, it's a model. So it's a computer study. It's particles that are being released in the bay and you can see with the tides going in and out, how those particles go through the channel. And so we can imagine those particles being a genetic material of fish or other animals living in the bay. And as they come in and out through the channel, then we can collect them with our water samples. Uh, let me switch side slide. Here we go. And so, with this project, the question that uh, we were asking were how does eDNA sampling compare with traditional methods to survey marine biodiversity in a tidal channel? Um, can eDNA be used to monitor biodiversity across time, across depths, tidal cycles, etc., for mar marine energy surveys? And so it was a two years project funded by uh, the Water Power Technology Office that combined field work on desktop work uh, to try to address these two questions. 
And so now we'll uh, summarize how we proceeded to uh, address these questions. And so we started with a desktop study to compare the cost of an eDNA fish survey with the cost of a fish survey using more conventional methods like beach seine and scuba diving. This was the work that uh, Michelle Fu did during her summer internship in 2021. And for that, she reviewed uh, journal articles for the methodologies and the supplies that uh, scientists used for sampling uh, uh, water samples, for collecting water samples and for processing them. Then when she had uh, all these different supplies, she looked for the cost of the supplies uh, and I calculated the average cost for the most common supplies. And then using this data, we set up a hypothetical uh, case study where we were sampling eDNA in uh, Squim Bay with uh, sampling fish, surveying fish in Squim Bay with eDNA surveys, but also with uh, beach seine and scuba divers on uh, to be able to compare the cost of those three different methods we included the cost of the supply of the labor for doing the work for collecting the data and then the permitting because when you use a beach sign you collect fish then you have to get specific permits for that and so we put all this cost together and we're able to compare the three methods the next uh, approach that we used was to actually go in the water and collect eDNA samples uh, in uh, 2021 using scuba divers. And the divers also collected photos at the same time as they were collecting eDNA. And this uh, photo here, the scuba diver, that's myself uh, collecting uh, water sample at about uh, 10, 10 meters deep uh, near the lab. And then we also collected samples uh, at the surface near the uh, floating docks that we have at the lab. And we collected these samples in March, in May, and in August. We also, uh, in uh, 2022, collected more samples, uh, this time uh, from the floating dock at a few meters under the surface. And uh, we're collecting them during uh, two different tides and during the ebb on the flow and the slack of the tide. So looking at this chart, um, you have here the high tide and then the low tide. The dark blue is a spring tide where the current is stronger and the water goes higher on the shore on, at high tide and lower, further away from the shore at low tide. And then we're also collecting during nip tide where the exchange of water is not as strong. So we collected during the ebb and the slack on the flow. And then once the samples were collected, uh, we filtered these samples uh, in the lab. So you can see here on this photo, this is Emily, uh, Emily Bundy, who is processing the 2022 uh, samples. And so you uh, pour the water into uh, a cup with a filter and then suck the water through that uh, apparatus and all the gen genetic material in the water gets collected on the filter. And then we save that filter into ethanol and send it to a subcontractor. It's a, a, a lab that is a, a different lab that is specialized in this kind of uh, uh, procedures. And so they did all the work from extracting the DNA from the filters to amplifying, sequencing the DNA, and then doing the bioinformatic anal analysis to identify the different species. And then the center the data and we analyzed it. And so Owen and Emily spent a lot of time analyzing the data to see what it could tell us. And so now we go on to the results back to Owen. Okay, and I'm gonna try and drive here. We practice this. It has to go from the Seattle area to the Squim area to the Richland area. So it's going to space, I'm sure. So as soon as I can get control, I will start driving. Let's see, here. do I have it yet? I have it. Hooray. All right. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you folks about um, 
just kind of the, the broad strokes here to start of the results. And, and again, I do want to uh, brag on our interns. Um, Michelle and Emily did a fantastic job. We love having interns at PNL. Um, we we get them from uh, during college, after college, after a master's degree. We get all sorts of folks coming out and and helping us out. Um, so the punchline really is that uh, eDNA is more cost effective than conventional methods. Um, what I'm showing you here to start um, is sort of a list of supplies that are required. And this list was assembled by Michelle. Um, and in yellow are the supplies that can be reused. So for eDNA, um, unfortunately, some of the, most of the things we use can't be reused, um, but we have to use less of them. So we don't need to use aquarium nets and aerators. We don't have to use underwater cameras. We don't have to send people down. Uh, underwater to do it. Um, this is a sort of a quantitation, excuse me, of those of those numbers. Um, so I'll just walk walk you through here. Um, let's see if I can get myself a little laser pointer. There we go. So we have eDNA compared with beach sane, compared with scuba diving. Um, and in the darker color, we have um, the cost for new supplies and the lighter color is the cost for reusable supplies. And then um, on the y-axis here, up and down, we have the cost in, in US dollars. Um, and so we can really quickly see that for both new and used, or not used, but reused supplies, uh, the cost for eDNA is substantially lower. Um, especially when we start talking about um, the, the time required for sen more senior researchers to do this work. Um, we do cost money, right? Um, it's all taxpayer funded money. Um, and it costs a lot less of that money to do uh, eDNA work versus a beach seine or, or, a, or a scuba dive to do the, to do the, um, uh, the survey. And actually this wound up making it into a paper. Um, Michelle got to be first author on a paper in 2021 um, about this exact topic. Uh, this uh, slide is, is the title is it's, it sampling outperforms diver counts. We're gonna talk about that in just a second. Um, this is really, the idea of this slide is really to give you an idea of what people see when they go to dive. And this is what people are trying to count. So. On the bottom, kind of brown on brown, is a buffalo sculpin, and somebody has to count that. Um, if you turn your head and squint in this little hole, you see a little sculpin here, and there's a crab kind of in the background. Here we see sea stars. Some of them are molted, some of them aren't. We have barnacles. Here we have a, a sea cucumber. There's a crab in there. Leneg knows exactly what to look for, and I kind of have to have to look. I'm a bacteriologist um, by by trade. Um, but you know, even I can see the barnacles, right? Um, so this is sort of the thing that that people have to look for when they when they're diving, and you have a limited amount of time when you're diving. Um, you only have so much air. You can only stay down for so many minutes at a given depth, um, and so people have to really um, maximize the time when they're down there to to, to find what they're looking for. Um, in this case. Uh, in 2021, scuba divers, we say scuba divers, uh, we mean the egg, um, identified uh, just four fish, fish species in 2021, whereas um, we identified uh, 96 unique 12S sequences. And so what we say here, so 12S is a specific gene that's common to all uh, eukaryotic life from people to fish to orangutans to horses. Everybody has this 12S gene. Um, as we think about different taxonomic levels, so we could have all, all fish with bones in them, say, we can design uh, identify, identifying primers, which are these little things, little DNA barcodes, essentially, that we use as part of this technique, that as, as we go through this technique, we only, we can fish out, so to speak, all of those 12S genes that are specific to fish. Um, and so when we see these unique sequences, we think, okay, those are unique to different kinds of fish, and we can identify them down to sometimes all the way to the species level. Sometimes it might be a family of fish. Um, of those unique sequences, we found 35 unique species. And I mentioned we can sometimes identify at different taxonomic levels, um, so that we found 16 sequences that we 
couldn't identify it down to exact species of fish, but we say, okay, this is a sculpin, this is a salmon, um, not necessarily down to a species. And in 2022, we did even better. Um, we uh, identified 250 unique sequences uh, comprising 37 unique species. And on the right here, we can see that uh, there's not a huge rhyme or reason to when we identified these, uh, these sequences. Um, they're, they're there, they're there all the time. Um, and using this technique, we can actually uh, identify species that we couldn't identify just by a visual survey. Let's see here, sorry, there we go. So this is a this is a figure. Um, it's a little complex. Um, I'll try and walk you through it. Uh, the punchline here is that the diversity of fish species in Squim Bay is very high, um, and so this is uh, this type of figure is called a phylogenetic tree. And what we've done to generate this figure is we have all of the sequences that we've generated during this project, and um, we use a, a computer, a pretty powerful computer, to align all of them up. And you can think of if all of them have a very similar sequence of DNA, um, the computer just basically lines them up and figures out where they're the same and where they differ. And using that alignment, um, the computer can calculate the, it's called the distance, the evolutionary distance between each of those sequences. And this figure here, uh, this tree, the don't pay attention to the, the length of these lines. Uh, they don't mean anything in this projection. Um, I just liked the way it looked for this purpose. Um, but we can see that we observe a, a diversity of fish. Um, so I've tried to put some of the more uh, um, commercially important fish like salmon, flounders, we have herrings, perches, and then some of the fish that are, are, are uh, common in the Pacific Northwest and in the Pacific in general, like sculpins or gunnels. Um, and each of these little uh, endpoints has it is color coded based on the type of fish it is. Um, and so we can see that there's a lot of different colors means a lot of different types of fish. Um, so that was really neat to be able to um, to really get at this genetic diversity within our fish populations. Um, we can get to sort of quantify that. So this is um, this is a, a representation of species diversity. So this is, really quantifying the differences present in that uh, figure I just showed you. And so this diversity metric is a very common metric used in this type of work. Um, and this is the metric itself is calculated from the total number of unique sequences that we observe. Um, and you can see that uh, the diversity, it ranges from zero to three and a half or so. There's no theoretical maximum on this, on this uh, metric. Um, however, more is better, higher is better, right? And so we see a, a, this diversity metric between two and three or so, it's a unitless number. Um, but this is actually similar to some other marine environments that, that we were able to track down um, in the US, in Asia, in one in Europe that we found. Um, so this is, is very encouraging that our work is consistent with other people doing the same work in other places. All right, so that was encouraging for us as we went through. Let's see, there we go. Um, this is a bit of a busy slide, but I'm gonna try and walk you through it. Um, I like to tell the punchline right away. So the punchline is that species diversity in this environment does not really differ that much between sampling months, sampling depths, um, this, uh, it's called an NMDS plot or non-metric multidimensional scaling plot. Um, and what has happened, what here we're looking at the total number of times that we observed a given sequence by month and location. So if I have sequences one, two, and three, I might observe sequence one, 10 times, sequence two, 100 times, sequence three, 500 times. And so all of that data gets crunched down into this two-dimensional plot. And what you can sort of see right away is that all of these data points are sort of intermingled. They're, they're separated a little bit, but they're, they're fairly intermingled. Um, if we saw, for example, um, all of the surface, uh, so the filled in, filled in little figures, we saw that all of them clustered off to one side 
and all of the seabed data clustered off to the other side, we might say, aha, these are very different. Here, they're, they're fairly similar, so we can, we can put some numbers to this. So if we compare between uh, the, each sampling date and other, and other dates or locations, um, we see that there's a reasonable degree of similarity between and within groups. Um, excuse me, that is, that's overall species diversity. Um, we can talk about, I'm sorry, I'm, I have to find the little button every time. Um, we can talk more granularly about individual species uh, abundance. And when I say abundance, again, I'm referring to the number of times that we observed a specific environmental DNA sequence belonging to a given species. Um, and so this is just a heat map is what we call this. And in this case, a lighter color means more abundant and a darker color means less abundant. And what we're doing is we're comparing each row is a given species, or sometimes I have to bring it up a level. So this is like a char, some species of char or some species of snailfish. Um, but like we have, you know, salmons, we have uh, sand dabs, which is a type of flatfish, kind of like a flounder, those sorts of things. And we can compare uh, our measurements from the seabed and the surface. Remember uh, in 2021, uh, samples were taken off of a dock and then also about 10 meters down uh, next to an underwater structure. Um, and we can see for going across for a given species, the, the levels are fairly consistent, um, which is, is it's interesting in itself um, that across 10 meters, we we don't see a huge difference, no matter if they're if they're you know surface dwelling fish or if they're more like top living fish, right, or whatever they are. Um, so that's really neat. And then we also use the same data to compare between um, uh, the the sampling months. So remember we did in in March, May, and August. Um, and again, if we look at any given species, the uh, abundance is fairly consistent across the sampling months. Um, things like salmon, we might ask, well, they're, are they running? Um, and the answer is not enough <laughs> to, to, uh, to observe a, a huge difference. Um, but this is, this is very interesting to us because it suggests that we can use this metric as, or this method as a stable, uh, a stable method across time um, to, to do these assessments. Um, going back to this NMDS plot again, um, now we're looking at data from 2022. And so this is where we were sampling at uh, those different tidal cycles that Leneg talked about. And this, in this case, the figure is even more obvious that like these are very, very similar samples, right? We don't see a huge breakout between um, stages of uh, if it's spring tide and neap tide, if it's, if it's an ebb or a flood part of the cycle. Um, these are very similar samples. And again, we can start looking at um, individual fish levels. Um, so this is the same type of heat map that I showed you before. Um, now we're just looking at comparing uh, neap and spring tides. So we can see again, if we look across every row that uh, the, the abundance, no matter if it's sampled during a neap, during a spring tide is very similar. There we go. And similarly, um, excuse me, the, the abundance of these uh, eDNA sequences are consistent on, at, on a per species level uh, during an ebb and a flow tide, tide cycle. Um, so again, this, this is encouraging to us because it, it, it again suggests that this is a usable method for assessing fish biodiversity. And it sort of gets at our one of our original questions, which was, you know, do these, do these uh, uh, sequences that we can pull out of the water column, do they do they vary at, at different tidal cycles across months? And the answer is is really like they they really don't. Um, they are very very consistent across the scales that we're measuring. And so that's the end of the data. So I'm going to give it back to an egg. Thank you. And I was trying to grab the mouse from you. <laughs> So thank you for presenting our results. Um, I'm now going to conclude for a couple of slides before we take your questions. And so why did our results matter? Uh, if I can, here we go. So 
our conclusions from that project is that eDNA is a cost-effective method and it's comprehensive and reliable. And so that provides a great alternative to conventional methods like beach sane or uh, scuba surveys for monitoring fish, uh, fish diversity in tidal channels. So as our results from uh, Michelle's work showed, it's low cost, much lower cost than beach sane on scuba surveys. Uh, we discussed that also uh, in the introduction, it's a lower risk to staff in the field than those uh, conventional methods because you just collect water samples and you don't need to um, uh, handle heavy equipment when the boat is rocking in all directions. It provides a um, higher resolution and sensitivity uh, for fish monitoring, like Owen was presenting. Uh, as a scuba diver, I only found four of the fishes that uh, Owen was able to identify with the sequence, uh, the genetic sequences. And, um, and last but not least, it's a non-invasive uh, method. So we don't need to collect the fishes. So we don't need to get permits and we are not harming the fish. We only get water samples. So eDNA is a valid approach for surveying fish, at least fish, in high energy environments near marine energy devices. We tried during the project to also look at invertebrates. It was not uh, very successful. So there is more development to do for that side of, of monitoring. To go a little further, so uh, eDNA would be a great uh, uh, method for marine energy monitoring if we can establish a cost-effective and easy to implement protocol to deploy those methods uh, at marine energy sites so that um, everybody who does monitoring around wave or tidal energy devices would know what uh, what supplies to get on how to collect the water uh, in a proper way that they are not contaminating the data. So we are hoping to work on that in the next uh, few years. Also, um, eDNA is a great tool to monitor the colonization of offshore wind uh, on the turbine foundations, like these uh, pictures here on the right shows. And some projects are starting to do that. Uh, there are projects in the UK, uh, on the east coast of the US, where offshore wind is starting to come into the water that I am aware of. And so with eDNA, we can look at the succession stages, like uh, which species uh, starts colonizing the piling first and are replaced by which ones and when. We can also track non-invasive species with this method. And uh, by just collecting water, we don't need to go up and down to piling with a diver or ROV. We just collect water and we can target non-invasive species and it will tell us if they are there or not. And we can also monitor how a, a wind turbine can work as an artificial reef by uh, monitoring how the different species uh, establish themselves around that uh, that uh, wind turbine. And so to do all this, we still need some technical development for the approach. And especially like Owen was uh, mentioning abundance, we are currently uh, just getting uh, semi-abundance. With, uh, we cannot associate a number of sequences to a number of fish, but there is work underway by numerous scientists around the world. And there is progress on uh, in the near future, we should be able to, to use eDNA to have some sort of abundance uh, data. Um, we could also uh, in the near future use eDNA to measure the connectivity between uh, different sites and especially like looking at marine energy or offshore wind sites, we could look at uh, use eDNA to look at the connectivity between the animals colonizing those uh, artificial structures and those colonizing the natural habitats. There is still some technical development needed, but we are making progress towards that, uh, that goal. And so I'd like to conclude with these words and thank uh, you for listening and thank the whole team. Again, Emily, Michelle, Owen, Nikki, Tony. And uh, I'll open the floor for, 
for questions. And uh, if we don't get to all of your questions uh, by the, in the next 10 minutes here yeah, or emails, you can reach out to either Owen or I, and uh, we can continue the discussion over emails. Great, thank you, Laneg and Owen. That was a great presentation. I appreciate you guys taking the time to discuss your research, and I know your audience appreciates it as well. We had approximately 35 people joining us tonight, and they definitely have some questions for you. Um, so I'm gonna jump right into the Q&A. Um, so the first question is, does the methodology analysis, i.e. two years, accommodate migratory species at the study site? So, so that's actually a really good question. Um, we didn't set out to do that. Um, the project we described was is kind of a pilot study um, to see if, if we could do it and how it performs. Um, one thing we would definitely be interested in uh, applying this to would be uh, the study of migratory species, um, such I mean, you think of all the commercially available or commercially important species, you know, the salmons, especially we think a lot of salmon here, right? We love our salmon, um, you know, salmon species, how they're migrating, um, their patterns migrating. Um, we think about uh, all the other commercial fish that we that we depend on economically and environmentally in the uh, in the ecosystem. Um, and, you know, I, I personally enjoy eating the the fish that come into into the area, and you know, I'd like to keep them around. Uh, but that's definitely a question that we would love to apply this this um, this study type of study to. And to add to Owen, that's why we looked at um, diversity uh, across months to see if we could have a sense of um, of difference and catch the migration of salmon. Unfortunately, we only had a few samples each month, so we couldn't get a good picture. But if we can uh, uh, continue the study and have more samples throughout the different seasons, then we'll be able to focus on the migratory uh, species and really look at if we can uh, uh, catch the migration of the salmon. We do have salmon coming through Squim Bay, so uh, we just didn't get a good picture of them we saw in uh, preliminary results. Great, thank you. Um, the second question is, the cost for all methods seems quite high. What is this based on? Is that cost per sample? Good question. It's not the cost per sample. It was a cost for all studies, so I didn't get into the details. But so we, the way we set up that uh, hypothetical survey, we had um let's say we had four sites on diff depending on the method we had different number of uh, staff being able to uh collect a uh, sample at those four sites and so for edna we considered collecting three samples at each four sites and then uh we compiled the cost of processing those uh 12 samples on uh, doing the analysis with them. And then for Beach Seine, we had four uh, nets collected. And so the time that it took the, the staff to deploy the net and then to collect the fish goes through the load. And so we discussed with, uh, with people that were expert in Beach Seine or in EDNA or with uh, scuba surveys to see how long it, it took them to do this kind of uh, of surveys and then we use the cost of uh, the hourly rate of a student or a more senior researcher to uh, to get those costs based on the hours. And so eDNA doesn't take that long. It's uh, it's very quick to collect a sample, a water samples and to process it in the lab. And then if you send it out to a subcontractor, it's relatively cheap, cheap to get the results back. Whereas doing Beach saying you need lots of hours to get ready, then to collect the fish, to process the fish. You also need to spend many hours ahead of time preparing for the work and obtaining the permits. You do have to have permits to do uh, that. So that adds a lot to the cost. And the uh, same for scuba surveys, you have lots of time ahead of time, lots of hours ahead of time to plan for the work. And then divers are usually about three hours, an hour to get on site and be ready, an hour underwater, an hour to come back. And then it takes time to 
process uh, the images on analyze count, count the fish and everything. So it's all that cost, all that labor that adds together. It's not much a supply, it's really the labor. And, and I'll add to that, um, another advantage of the eDNA work is that the analysis pipeline that we have, once it's set up and it works, you don't have to go back every time and reinvent it. Um, it's a you know some pieces of software that we have available, and we just you know go beep beep boop boop essentially, and uh, we get our answers out. You know we only have to build the wheel once, um, whereas if you are diving, you have to you know you have to get your materials every time, you have to investigate your photos every time. Um, so that's a, another back end savings um, that is an advantage. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, will you measure changes frequency of species presence to find out how it may change in presence of marine energy generators? So that is a goal. Uh, we currently don't have a tidal energy device uh, here at the lab in Squim Bay. So we, the study that we did was to set up the, the work, the ground, do the groundwork before we have a, a turbine to monitor around. And so we were really assessing how it works on if we do get good results in a tidal channel before we can take that method and go to a place that has a tidal uh, turbine or wave energy device, and then uh, uh, hopefully collect uh, samples before the device is in the water and then collect after the device has been installed at a different uh, different times, like the day after, a month after, um, I don't know. We would have to make a, a specific plan and then compare. And if we have other results, compare with what we collected before. So that's the goal. We are not there yet. Great, thank you. Um, so this one is says, um, I am a postmaster's RA in the ARL in Richland, um, the Aquatic Research Laboratory. Um, thinking about longevity of eDNA in the water column, do we have any ideas how long eDNA remains um, in the water and could be included in a sample? For example, if one fish passes through once a year, will it show up even say seven months after it's gone? Does it depend on the genetic material they shed into the water and how long um, it takes to decay? Yep, good oh, question. We love that question. <laughs> <laughs> there is part of the answer already in the question. So it depends. It really depends. You remember the map I showed at the beginning with the red uh, dots that go in and out of the bay? So it depends on uh, the hydrodynamic of the site on how the currents go in and out. Sometimes the current are stronger and will flush the DNA quicker, faster away. It depends also how much genetic material the animal sheds. And some animals, some life stages, some species might shed more than others. Some fish create lots of mucus and like a, like a parrot fish makes a, a cocoon at night out of mucus, there is lots of DNA in that and they make a new cocoon every night. And so that is a lot of DNA, whereas a salmon might just swim through and uh, not, not shed much as it goes through. So it depends on the species, it depends on the life stage, and it depends also on uh, lots of parameters that uh, will affect how the DNA, the genetic material, uh, survives, quote unquote, in the water, like with if there is lots of bacterial activities, that uh, genetic material could be degraded super fast. If there is lots of UV radiation, it could be degraded. Um, so it really depends. And there is lots of studies at different uh, research groups that look into that. Uh, they do uh, lab work on with fish in uh, aquariums to see how much material they shed on uh, how uh, how long it stays in the water, how long it travels in the water, all these things. So it's a lot of different parameters to take into account. Yeah, I think in an, in an ideal world, if I you know if I geek out on this, um, in an ideal world, we'd be able to take a bucket of DNA and dump it into the bay, 
and see what happens, right? We could tag it with something. They're probably not going to let us dump a bucket of DNA into Squim Bay, so we have to think of other ways to do it. Um, but yeah, as Linux said, there is there is a host of parameters and water conditions and environmental conditions that will affect um, the half-life of a DNA molecule. We don't exactly have a good handle on that. Um, even as Lang mentioned, like different types of fish are, you know, they secrete different amounts of DNA into the, in, into the, into the water column. Um, and, you know, it could also be an orca that has eaten a fish and is, you know, as happens once you eat the fish, the remains of the fish leave the orca. And is there is that some DNA? Um, you know, we are these are questions we'd we'd like to be able to answer. Uh, they're not questions that we've answered yet. Um, but there are there are group research groups out there that are looking into this, like actively researching, you know, how how long it takes to degrade a DNA molecule in the water column. Um, and I think in future iterations of this work, we'd like to um take those parameters into account um, at, at a you know sort of statistical level um, to try and to get at exactly the sort of question you're asking. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so this is going to be our last question. Um, since we're a little bit over time, but we um, I just want to get to it. So how do you differentiate between the eDNA of a fish and the eDNA of um, a fish that has been eaten and um, deficiated in your sample area? That's exactly what Owen was uh, <laughs> was bringing oh, up. Just, okay, good. No, I, I, a, I guess I guess I was like psychic and foresaw the next question. You did. Okay, great, awesome. So um, we we don't know yet how to differentiate that. Uh, uh, I haven't done the literature review to see if it's been done. If uh, if uh, eaten DNA is the same as uh, not eaten DNA, is there? It, we might get salmon DNA from uh, an orca that uh, ate a salmon on defecated in the bay. That's uh, something right now we cannot uh, differentiate. Yeah, yeah, and, and interestingly enough, some of the, I guess, pioneering studies in the Puget Sound were about uh, orca diets, and they used this technique and essentially followed a pod of orcas around waiting to collect the leftover dna so this is it's a real it's a real question that needs to be addressed it's it's a good one great well thank you again for sharing your research with the community and thank you all to um everyone who joined and took the time under their busy schedules to attend tonight's seminar um i'd like to remind everyone one last time to take our brief survey um you'll also have a chance to sign up um to receive notifications for future seminars um, we'll hope you'll join us for our September 12th seminar. Um, more information will be posted on our events page. Um, so be sure to check back there. Um, so again, thank you so much to everyone who joined us um, and hope to see you in September. Have a great evening. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for attending.